Hello, I'm Louise Harmby, and in this video, I'll be offering an overview of crime fiction's subgenres. So, why is this useful? Well, first of all, knowing where your novel fits in terms of subgenre or subgenres, if there's a crossover, helps you consider your readers and what they'll expect. Also, which published writers you can learn from, and how you might stand out and make your contribution to the genre a little different. And second, if you're going alone, one of your publishing jobs will be to help your readers find your book. So when you upload to Amazon, Smashwords or any other distribution platform, you'll need to decide which book industry standards and communications codes to place your book under. And third, if you're going down the traditional publishing route, identifying your subgenres will help a literary agent understand which publishers have a best fit list and where in a book in a bookstore your novel would be shelved. If the fit isn't obvious to you it might be harder to convince your agent that your book's marketable. That doesn't mean you have to fit into only one subgenre. These days crime fiction frequently includes more than one. I'm going to provide an overview of some of the established subgenres, although the list isn't exhaustive. Um, there's crossover certainly, and depending on the commentator, crime fiction gets chopped up into subgenres variously. I've elected not to focus on inverted detective fiction, heists and capers, LGBTQ mysteries, feminist crime fiction, or romantic suspense, but these subgenres and more all have their place in the market. One thing I can say is crime fiction doesn't stand still. So first of all, let's talk about the cosy. If much of today's crime fiction seems gritty, even gratuitously violent, um, and that's not the way you want to write, don't fret. Cosy crime is alive and kicking, although gently. <laughs> Alison Flood says, publishers are rushing to bring lost golden age authors such as Annie Haynes back into print and to repackage the likes of Marjorie Allingham and Frances Durbridge. So if cosy is your thing, there's definitely a market for it. So what distinguishes the cosy? Murder, yes, but leave out the gore, the pain and depressing social commentary. Your protagonist might well be flawed, but no more so than anyone else in the novel. And your readers will embrace your hero's quirkiness with a, quick, a skip in their step. Now, that doesn't mean that the cosy isn't tight on plot and well-paced action that drive the novel forward. Contemporary readers still want fantastic mysteries with twists and turns that will keep them guessing. Cozies can be liberating for the, play, the playful crime writer who wants to explore the genre with non-traditional characters placed in non-traditional settings. A few examples include Agatha Raisin, uh, that character is a former PR agent who moves to a village in the Cotswolds. Amy Meyer's August Didier Mysteries feature a Victorian master chef come sleuth. And Lillian Jackson Braun's The Cat Who Mysteries feature Jim Quilleran and his sleuthing cat Coco. And finally, Nancy J. Cohen's Bad Hair Day Mysteries feature a beauty salon owner. Next up is classic detective, The Golden Age and Beyond. R.D. Collins locates the start of the genre with Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue. It found its feet with Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes and entered into a so-called Golden Age in the 1920s with Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot and Dorothy L. Sayers' Lord Peter Whimsey, amongst others. The Golden, the Golden Age introduced rules for the genre, so let's take a quick look at those. Rule number one, all the clues available to the investigator must be available to the reader. Number two, there must be a body and we must be introduced to it quickly. Three, the perpetrator can't conveniently appear out of nowhere in the finale. Four, the crime must be solved by deduction rather than coincidence. Five, there must be multiple clues that can be interpreted in a variety of ways and more than one suspect. Six, details must be accurate and seven, no cheating with doubles and magic. <laughs> Today's authors should abide by the same rules, no matter whether their tales are set in Oxford with Morse, LA with Bosch or Reykjavik with Erlandur. Now we're on to hard boiled. Here's a quote from Raymond Chandler in conversation with Ian Fleming in 1958. Los Angeles has never been written about. California had been written about a book called Ramona, a lot of sentimental slop, but nobody in my time had tried to write about a Los Angeles background in, a, in any realistic sort of way. And so Chandler's response was to write crime fiction that was gritty, depressing, violent, cynical and seedy. And so Hard Boiled was born. Hard boiled crime writing pulls no punches. The protagonists aren't invulnerable superheroes and the environments within which they operate are those of contrast, urban decay and tourist hotspots, hope and corruption. 
If your crime rating falls into this category, don't set an amateur protagonist sleuth alongside some foolish law enforcement officer who has neither the brains nor the access to detection resources. Hardboiled isn't pretty, but it's rich in believability. Plots are fattened with complex characters, social commentary and, of course, murder. Matthew Lewin talks about the contemporary hard-boiled crime fiction of James Lee Burke and James Elroy, saying, There is a fury and desperation in this new writing that touches on the violence and depravity of our time, as well as the grace and beauty of the best in human nature and the physical world. So think Harry Bosch. Tim Walker refers to his creator, Michael Connolly, as the modern Raymond Chandler. Connolly says he still sees it as his duty to acknowledge the social climate in his novels. I think also Rebus, Ian Rankin, like Connolly, fuses hard-boiled with police procedural masterfully. The thing about hard-boiled is that even when the crime is solved, your readers won't expect to close the book feeling that everyone will live happily ever after. Let's look now at historical crime fiction. Popular series feature C.J. Sansom's Shard Lake, S.J. Paris's Giordano Bruno, Susanna Gregory's Thomas Chaloner and Ellis Peters' Brother Cadfile. And I think the genre is as interesting for its criminal investigations as for its lessons in social history. And because the reader needs to understand the historical setting, these novels are often long. Samson's Dark Fire comes in at a whopping 600 plus pages. I have the hardback version and I'm telling you, I bolt up my biceps just carrying the book from Waterstones to the car park. <laughs> Now, if historical fiction floats your boat, be prepared to put in the research. Many of your readers will know their history, so you'll need to dig deep. It's no accident that the protagonists in these novels are curious renegade monks, lawyers, scholars and the like. The criminal justice system as it exists in our era bears little resemblance to that in these bygone days. So consider the following. How did the law work in your time period and location? And where did power reside with the church, the monarchy, the government or the military? Something else? What obstacles would your protagonist have been up against? Think about gender, access to education and class boundaries for starters. And would your antagonist have had an easier ride than a contemporary baddie? Um, if you think about modern forensics, technology, transport, communications and socio socioeconomic factors. Now, some historical fiction is cosier and shorter. Um, consider David Dickinson's Lord Powers Court and Emily Brightwell's Mrs. Jeffrey series. These Victorian mysteries offer plenty of intrigue and good old fashioned murder, but we're spared the grisly details. And don't be surprised to see this lighter crime fiction splashed with a dose of humour as the authors cast their gaze over the social, economic and gender disparities typical of the era. Still, if Regency and Victorian cosies are your bag, you'll need to gen up on the period details. How about legal and medical crime fiction? Courtrooms, labs and hospitals make for great crime fiction. And Stephen D. Rogers argues that lawyers and doctors make effective protagonists since they seem to exist on a plane far above the rest of us. And although popular, these tales are usually penned by actual lawyers and doctors due to the demands of the information presented. So think John Grisham, author of A Time to Kill and The Runaway Jury. He's a former criminal lawyer. Uh, Kathy Reichs, author of Deja Dead and Bare Bones, is certified by the American Board of Forensic Anthropology. And Robin Cook, author of Coma and God Player, is a trained medical doctor. That old trope of writing what you know comes into play here, and it's a good reminder that using your own specialist knowledge to bring authenticity to your crime writing makes good sense. And if you're not a former cop, doc or lawyer, but you have friends who are, do pick their brains. In particular, research the role of your legal and medical protagonist and ensure that the powers of investigation that you assign to them are appropriate for their location. What a coroner can do here in the UK, where I live, might differ from a medical examiner in the USA or Hong Kong. And even if you're pushing the boundaries of existing science, the foundations will need to be solid if you want to give your reader the best experience. Now we're on to one of my favourites, the locked room mystery. The crime scene is that of a moving train, a secluded, heavily guarded house, an aeroplane. Locked room mysteries are less who done it than how done it. A locked room novelist is the illusionist of crime writing, the creator of impossible fiction. And yet not so impossible as it turns out, as our brilliant protagonist gradually reveals all. Do take care though, no cheating is allowed with locked, locked room crime. Here's a quote from Otto Penzler. No cheating about hidden panels, long lost twins, waking from dreams or hallucinations. 
Well-known examples include And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie, The Hollow Man by John Dixon Carr, and The Murders in the Room Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe. Now, the artistry of the Lot Room mystery lies in the author's ability to, de to deliver a reveal that doesn't rely on a device that doesn't exist in real life, that doesn't require information to be deliberately withheld from the reader, and isn't so obvious as to be deducible at the beginning of the story. For aspiring lot room crime writers who want to see masters at work, I recommend The Lot Room Mysteries, Otto Penzler's superb anthology. Next up is the police procedural. If you're writing one of these, your in-depth research will need to be top-notch. The angle you take will be determined by your protagonist skills. So examples could include um, Harry Bosch, Michael Connolly's detective, M.R. Hall's Jenny Cooper, a coroner, Ian Rankin's John Rebus, another detective, Patricia Cornwall's Kay Scarpetta, a medical examiner, Hedig Mankel's Kurt Belander, another detective, uh, Jeffrey Deaver's Lincoln Rhyme, a forensic consultant, and Kathy Reichs's Temperance Brennan, a forensic anthropologist. Procedurals are notable for their thoroughly researched and authentic rendering of detection, evidence gathering, forensics, autopsies and interrogation procedures in order to solve the novel's crimes. Wowzer tools and tech don't come at the cost of strong characterisation though. Rhyme is paralysed following an on-scene accident. Cooper is recovering from the breakdown of her marriage. Rebus has a history of trauma dating from his former military career. Valander has diabetes and his daughter attempted suicide in her teenage years. These in-depth backstories provide complexity and conflict, a kind of layering that fattens the plot without complicating it. Now, I find Cooper a little whiny, Rebus rather grumpy, Scarpetta a little arrogant, and Valander frankly depressing. But that doesn't stop me falling in love with them though. In fact, flawed characters can balance the sterility of the procedural details, and you, the writer, might find a protagonist with foibles more enjoyable to write. Mankell did. And about Valander, he said, it's quite true that I don't particularly like him, but then I think most writers would say it's more interesting to write about a person you don't like. It's much better to have something between you and your main character that grates. And now the spy thriller. When it comes to spy stories, your protagonist is a spook, the nation's safety, the hook. And it's a race against time, against a larger than life antagonist in order to save, well, everyone. The plots are usually complex and the action high octane. And Graham Shimon says, when you're writing spy fiction, you have one overriding goal, to keep the reader turning the pages. And here's some great advice from Catherine Royd. Don't wing it when it comes to plot. A spy novel needs to be thought out beforehand, even more so than novels of most genres. Unlike, say, a, qu a quest fantasy, where plots can be shuffled or cut out or added without too much trouble, Royd says, everything needs to be compactly connected to the main plot. Unplotted whims simply do not have a place. Now, if you're wandering into spy-fi territory, you'll have a little more freedom to play with gadgetry. If you're keeping it real though, do the research, know your guns and your gear so that your protagonist doesn't end up more tactical than tactical. Your spy crime fiction doesn't have to be high octane like Robert Ludlum's or Clive Custer's. Um, Mick Heron is one of my favorite authors and in his novels, the pace is a little gentler, but the brooding narrative is utterly believable. His Jackson Lamb series features the slow horses, MI5 agents who've messed up and been put out to graze in the backwoods of inactive service. Now Heron's crime isn't spy-fi. There are no wacky gadgets to get Lamb's crew out of a fix. The characters are vulnerable, they're disgruntled and they're bored until there's a crime and Lamb suspects the spooks. It's a fine example of character-driven writing with attention to detail on service procedural and detection legwork. How about The Private Eye and Amateur Sleuth? The Private Eye tradition crosses subgenres from cosy to hard-boiled to classic thriller. For cosies, consider M.C. Beaton's Agatha Raisin Mysteries and Agatha Christie's Miss Marple. Here, the amateur sleuth is surrounded by far less knowledgeable and somewhat hapless police officers. For hard-boiled, think Chandler's Philip Marlowe and Tim Weaver's David Raker. Raker is a former journalist who, following the death of his wife, turns to investigating missing persons. Sarah Paretsky and Sue Grafton offer two examples of gritty female PI protagonists in the form of V.I. Vashorsky and Kinsey Milhone. One of my favourites is accidental detective Myron Bolliter, a slightly softer boiled sports agent with excellent martial arts skills and a compelling backup team. 
And let's not forget Precious from Otsway, Alexander McCall Smith's delicious founder of the number one ladies detective agency. McCall Smith manages to keep things light without getting too cosy and captivate without shocking. It's gentle, penetrating crime fiction. And telling the story through a point of view character who works outside law enforcement has its advantages. Your protagonist can behave and move in ways that a detective can't, at least not without risking their job. On the other hand, your sleuth won't have access to a wealth of contemporary resources available to the police. And so take care not to make your amateur successes depend on witless professionals. Certainly every organisation or service has its fools and bad apples and crime fiction is the perfect tool with which to explore police and state corruption. But contemporary readers are unlikely to engage with a novel whose chief investigator is an oaf. And now let's talk about transgressor or noir crime fiction. If this is your bag, you'll go where others fear to tread. Who done it is still in the mix, but why done it is close behind. The noir genre shares the grit of hard boiled, but it's distinctive for its focus on the narratives of the transgressor, like in McNamee's Resurrection Man, the victim, as in Larson's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, or both, as in Lippmann's I'd Know You Anywhere. The authors who do this subgenre best seem almost to be able to channel their character's psychosocial conflict and dig deep into the predator prey relationship. And even when the detective is the protagonist, they're less superhero than anti-hero, troubled by demons, working despite rather than within an establishment as troubled as them. Think Elroy's LA Confidential or Varenne's Bed of Nails. Otto Penzler says of the genre in its purest form, there are no heroic figures in noir fiction. The noir story with a happy ending has never been written, nor can it be. The lost and corrupt souls who populate these tales were doomed before we met them because of their hollow hearts and depraved sensibilities. Now, regional variants have emerged to international acclaim, for example, Tartan, Scandinavian and Emerald Noir. And these are notable for how they represent the landscape, the culture, the idiom and the social and political identity of the settings. And I want to talk quickly about something I mentioned right at the beginning. Um, your book might be a fusion of several subgenres. And if we consider China Mieville's The City in the City as an example, in this novel, two locations occupy the same physical space. Now, at heart, it's a police procedural, but there's a speculative fantasy take on the hard-boiled tradition, the shiny surfaces of one city butt up against a grubbier alternate, yet residents of each are legally bound to unsee each other. And as such, Mievel incorporates a subtle commentary on state authoritarianism, surveillance and corruption um, into a classic murder investigation. And so subgenre fusion can really help your work stand out. Just take care to recognise the conventions of each subgenre that you include so that the core elements are done well. No reader will thank you for promising a fusion of hard boiled and proce police procedural if both are half baked. So that's it. I hope you found that useful and I wish you sleuthing success on your crime writing journey. Bye for now.